Okay, so let's recap the sleep and dreaming topic. First, we're starting off with why do we actually sleep? First, what's noting it's universal and instinctive. That means that everybody does it and that we can't avoid doing it. And the reasons why we do sleep, firstly, it keeps us safe in the dark. We tend to sleep at night time. This is when we would be vulnerable to predators in the past or prone to accidents because we can't see. So sleeping keeps us safe. Secondly, it promotes a healthy brain. So it resets synaptic activity. That's the little gap between the, the neurons in the brain. Um, it allows us to consolidate new memories and old memories. And also the space between brain cells actually gets bigger, which allows us to clear out toxins and stops neurodegeneration. That's when those neurons are um, kind of dying and are becoming less functional. Also, we do it for physical repair. So during particularly slow wave sleep, um, our cells are healed. It also balances out our hormones. During sleep, our immune system activity increases, so it helps you to recover from illnesses. Um, and during deep sleep, that we also release growth hormones. The final reason that we sleep is for emotional stability. So during sleep, we produce less cortisol. Cortisol is the long-term stress hormone. So if we produce less of it, um, we are have lower stress levels. Um, it also allows our brain to balance out any chemicals and hormones, thus making us more emotionally stable. There are some key features of sleep that you need to know. So during sleep, there are five different stages, one to four, and REM, rapid eye movement sleep. You can see an EEG trace for the brain activity in each of these stages of sleep. Um, but essentially, you need to know the different brain waves and the features of the stage. So in stage one, there are so synchronized alpha waves, they become beta waves. Uh, in the stage, you're quite drowsy, but you're easy to wake up. If you are to wake up, you don't really realize you've been asleep. You might have some muscle spasms and falling sensation. You spend 10% of your time in this stage. Moving on to stage two, um, this is uh, where your theta brain waves, they become slower and you have occasional bursts of more rapid brain waves. We lose consciousness to the outside world at this point. We're not aware of what's going on. 50% of your sleep is in stage two. In stage three, you have slow brain waves that alternate with shorter and faster waves. Um, and you spend 10% of your time in the stage. Um, this is referred to as deep sleep, uh, along with stage four, where there are only delta waves. Now, the features of, of both stage three and four um, is that it's very difficult to wake the person. There's no eye movement, no muscle activity. Your growth hormone is released, um, and this will aid with physical repair. Finally, you move on to REM sleep. This is fast brain waves, which is very similar to being awake, but it's not because you're asleep. The features of the sleep, um, you breathe quickly, your eyes move rapidly, your limbs are paralysed, you have a high heart rate and a high blood pressure, your body temperature can increase or decrease, and this is when your dreams are most likely to occur. You spend 20% of your time in REM sleep. Now these stages are a cycle, so you go through each stage, um, and then you go, it takes about 90 minutes, and then you go back to stage one, and you repeat again until you wake up. Now, um, part of the sleep is the sleep-wake cycle. There has to be something, a biological rhythm that determines whether or not you are awake and whether or not you're asleep. And this is helped out by endogenous pacemakers and exogenous side gamers. So let's look at endogenous pacemakers first. So these are internal biological body clocks that manage your bodily rhythms. In sleep, this is the suprachiasmatic nucleus, referred to as the SCN. This is located in the hypothalamus, so it's part of your brain. It receives information about the light outside or kind of in your environment from your optic nerve and it delays melatonin release until dark. Melatonin is a hormone, it's released by the pineal gland in the brain um, and when melatonin is released you become drowsy and tired and this allows you to go to sleep. So the exogenous sight gamer for sleep will, well these are in general, these are features of the environment which can be physical or social. For sleep, this is going to be light. So when it is light outside, um, we, there is a neural pathway, so neurons from your retina at the back of your eye to your brain, and it sends information about how light it is, um, and then whether or not the SCN needs to get the pineal gland to secrete melatonin. There are uh, two sleep sores that you need to know, both of which are types of insomnia. So the first one is sleep onset insomnia. This is when you struggle to fall asleep can be caused by anxiety, caffeine, um, eating a heavy meal before bed, playing computer games before bed, or being in physical pain. The other type is sleep maintenance insomnia. So this is where you're able to fall asleep, but you wake regularly throughout the night. This can be caused by depression, alcohol, restless leg syndrome, 
being in the room with someone snoring or menopause in women. So that's um, some of the key concepts around sleep. We now start to look at our first theory of dreaming. And our first theory was created by Freud. Now, all of Freud's work um, relies on a few key ideas. Firstly, is that we have an unconscious mind that derives our behaviour. It is unconscious, meaning we do not have access to it. We can't describe what's happening in our unconscious mind because we don't know. We're not aware of it. Now, he thought that we could analyse dreams to get access to the unconscious mind. The unconscious mind is largely made up of the id. Now, this is another key idea of Freud's, is that we have the id, the ego, and the superego. So the id is instinctive, it's primal, it, it um, kind of drives that behaviour, and it's particularly focused around aggression and sex. The ego keeps us in touch with reality, and the superego is our very moral conscience. So the unconscious mind is largely made up of the id. Now, um, these primal instincts that we have, um, they have to be repressed. And repressed means that they are pushed into the unconscious mind. But, although we push them down, they will eventually need to be released. And he suggests that dreams are where uh, these instincts are released. So a key idea of Freud's theory of dreaming is that dreams um, fulfil wishes. So the dreams challenge our ego, that's the part of the personality that keeps you in touch with reality. It stops the id from um, releasing one of those instinctive um, drives. Uh, so it occurs when we're vulnerable when we're asleep and in our dreams allow us to act out our deepest desires in a dream for example fighting with a sibling having an argument these are all aggressive um instincts that we that our id might want us to do um we've repressed it but it's come out in the dream freud also said that there are two types of content to our dreams there is the manifest content which is the actual content of the dream so you might dream about a sword but then there is the latent content. So this is an underlying meaning of what that object represents. So according to Freud, swords and pole-like objects, they all represent penises. Now, there are quite a few criticisms associated with Freud's theory of dreaming. Firstly, it is too subjective. Dream interpretation is open to opinion. Just because Freud thinks that so uh, swords and poles represent penises doesn't mean they actually do. A different psychologist might interpret it differently. They are notoriously difficult to test. Um, we cannot make, be certain that people are correctly recording their dreams that we're analysing and we cannot observe or measure the unconscious mind. So it's kind of a non-scientific way of doing things. We cannot test it. Um, all of Freud's theory is based on unreliable research. Most of his evidence is from case studies, so we cannot generalise his findings beyond the individual or individuals in that case. Um, he also has a narrow interpretation of dreams in this theory. So he only relates the dreams to wish fulfilment, particularly in sex and aggression. Now this cannot be true of all dreams, for example, some nightmares. Uh, therefore, um, he, his interpretations don't necessarily apply to all dreams. Finally, there is cultural and historical bias. At the time when Freud created his theory, he was in the early 1900s. Um, the a society it was had very strict views around sex at the time. Um, so perhaps the idea of repressing any thoughts from sex um, are more appropriate in that period of time, whereas now people have much more liberal views, so it might not necessarily be the same. Now, linking to Freud's theory of dreaming is the first key study that you need to know, and it was done by Freud himself in 1918, and it's called Analysis of the Wolfman. So the aim was to kind of investigate this individual who had come to him with poor mental health. So the method that he used, it was a case study because it was just the one man, and it was to investigate this man's mental illness. He conducted interviews in um, the early 1900s, but then analysed them 15 years later, therefore it was a longitudinal study. The sample um, was the Wolfman, here is his real name, um, or we'll refer to him as Wolfman for confidentiality, um, and he was in his 20s. In 1906, his sister had committed suicide. Then in 1907, his father also committed suicide, and as a result, he developed depression and hence sought out Freud, who was um, kind of developing this new age of psychology to help him with his mental health. The procedure. So this study focuses on the treatment of a childhood dream um, that Wolfman had. And you can see why he's called Wolfman now, because he dreamt that white wolves were sat on a, willow, uh, sorry, on a walnut tree outside his room watching him. 
So that's what the dream was, and Freud was analysing this dream. Now the results of the study. So, Freud suggested that this recurring nightmare was due to um, the Wolfman witnessing a traumatic event as a child, which was witnessing his parents have sex whilst he was pretty young. Freud suggested the wolf represents the father, the fact that they were white represents the bed linen and underwear of his parents, and the fact that they are the wolves are watching him is a role reversal because the wolf man was watching his parents have sex and now the wolves that represent his father are watching him. Um, the tree represents Christmas because it, um, this happened around Christmas time. So what did Freud interpret this as? He said that the wolf man had an unconscious desire to be seduced by his father and this was caused by the pleasure of receiving presents at Christmas which was mirrored by the pleasure on his mum's face when he witnessed them having sex. Um, he said that the mother had been castrated by the father because the mother clearly had no penis so the wolfman developed uh, castration anxiety so he was nervous around the power of his dad um, and hence why he thought the wolf might eat him in his dream. So that was Freud's interpretation of the dream. And what Freud concluded from his research in this case study is that the unconscious mind has a significant effect on behaviour and traumatic events that um, are witnessed can be repressed, um, but they may also resurface, for example, in a dream. Now, I'm sure you're thinking of lots already, but there are some criticisms of the study. Firstly, it's too subjective. Again, just like the theory, this is one person's view, Freud's, on this dream, and so it's heavily biased. Another criticism is that it um, relies fully on the wolf's memory, so he could have been recalling the um, dream differently to how it actually happened, and this would therefore have affected how um, Freud might have been analysing things that didn't actually happen, essentially. Um, the study has a strong focus on the unconscious, which, as we know, cannot be observed. It also cannot be reported on by the person, because they don't know, they, you cannot access your unconscious, um, so this is a limitation. Um, another limitation is that the wolfman himself had mental health problems. So the findings may not represent those with good mental health. And finally, similarly, uh, it's a very small sample, one person, so we cannot generalise these findings of the study beyond the wolfman himself. So that's our first theory and core study of dreaming. Let's now look at the other theory you need to know about, and that is called activation synthesis theory of dreaming. This was developed by Hobson and Macaulay in 1977. So they stated in REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement sleep, there are powerful electrical signals that pass through the brain as sudden spikes. So in the brain, there's lots of neurons firing, um, messages um, are sent along neurons as electrical impulses. So these are firing constantly. He said, or they said that the um, signals, they start in the pons, which is part of the brainstem, and also in the neurons that activate eyes. And they're sent to two different areas, the limbic system, which is kind of an evolutionary part of the brain. It's kind of primal, primal again, um, instinctive. And the occipital lobe, which is in the cerebral cortex, it's a high level processing area. Now they say that this activation occurs frequently and the brain tries to make sense or attach meaning to these random brain firings. And as a result, we start to have dreams related to whatever is firing in our brain. So for example, if that, um, you know, if that electrical signal passes through the part of your brain that you might involve whilst running, you might then start to dream about running. This could also be why dream contents shift so frequently, because the electrical impulse is just firing everywhere throughout the brain. So that's the theory. There are some criticisms resulting uh, about this theory. Firstly, it is too reductionist. Now, this is a biological theory. Um, so the it simplifies highly complex phenomena of dreaming down to neuronal firing, which perhaps is not correct. Secondly, um, it talks about how the um, neuronal firing is random, but dreams aren't always random. Sometimes dreams relate to your day, and therefore this theory cannot account for that. Uh, some people have continuity to their dreams, so they might have a reoccurring dream, they might wake up, then go back um, asleep to the same dream. So this goes against the idea of randomness again. Additionally, dreams can occur in non-REM stages, so this neuronal activity only happens in REM sleep. In non-REM sleep, so stages 1 to 4, there is much less um, activity in the brain. So the brain activity is reduced in non-REM sleep, but... Is it then the neuronal firing that's causing these dreams if it's not really happening? Finally, 
Um, people with damaged brain stems, so that's where the signal arises from, still have dreams. So um, if they're still able to dream, then it can't be these brain signals that are starting in the pons for, uh, as part of the brain stem, because even those without brain stems or damaged brain stems still experience dreams. So that's the criticisms. To support this theory, there is a your second core study, and it's Pisanus in Dreams and Fantasies by Williams et al. in 1992. So the aim of this study was to assess Pisanus in dreams, which when you're asleep, versus fantasies when you're awake, to show that they are different processes. The method used was a natural experiment. The reason being was because they could not alter the independent variable themselves. So the independent variable was whether it was a dream or whether it was a fantasy. That occurs naturally, we cannot change that. People are either awake or asleep, um, and so it was natural. And they did use self-report as well. The participants were 12 Harvard University students, 10 of which were female, 2 were male, um, and their age range was 23 to 45. Uh, so the procedure. They got the participants to write in a journal for one term. They had to write down um, their dream or their fantasy, um, pretty much as it was happening. Um, and as a result, they got 60 dream and 60 fantasy reports, and they quantitatively analysed them. There were three judges who did this analysis. The judges were not told whether they were dreams or whether they were uh, fantasies. Um, and they established good interrate reliability of 0.8 or 80%. So this was the rating scale that they used. Um, so they rated, if it was about a plot, the thoughts of the dreams of the character, the emotions of the dreams of the character, or if it was other. And they rated it whether it was discontinuity, incongruity, uncertainty, or it was just not bizarre. And they used this to create a mean density score or a mean bizarreness score. So let's have a look at the results. Firstly, they found there were significant differences in bizarreness density scores. So dreams had a density score of 0.223, whereas fantasies 0.089. So dreams were more bizarre. There was a large difference in plot discontinuity um, and then smaller differences in plot incongruity, thought incongruity and uncertainty. The judges also had 88.7% accuracy in determining whether the um, general they were analysing was a dream or fantasy. So they were definitely considered to be different um, phenomena. Let's see what the researchers concluded from this. So they concluded that the dream that dream bizarreness was a direct neural correlate of the neuronal activity that happens during REM. So that random firing of nerve cells in the REM sleep causes your bizarre dreams. Um, they also concluded that dreams and fantasies are different types of cognitive activity. There is a small overlap in cognitive features, but they attributed this to the fact that in REM sleep and on the sleep-wake boundary, um, there are some similarities. For example, we don't recognise external stimuli. Um, there's some similarity in brain functioning. Um, so that's what they attributed that to. There are some criticisms for this study. Firstly, it relies completely on self-report. So this meant it was particularly open to social desirability bias. People might have been very embarrassed about their dreams. They might not have wanted to report them uh, exactly as they happened, so they might have changed it slightly. Secondly, um, the reports, we could not control when or how they were written because they were self-report. So although they were meant to write their report straight after having the dream or the fantasy, um, this is not possible at all. Um, so some details may have been forgotten, or they might have um, unconsciously changed the detail. They might have processed the dream a bit more, the fantasy a bit more, uh, and kind of deduced a meaning and kind of changed what they wrote about it. Another criticism is that there is a lack of control over the independent variable, that being whether it was a dream or a fantasy. So um, participants may have recorded dreams that weren't during REM sleep. So we could, it's when you wake up, you don't know if you've been in REM sleep or not without seeing brain scans. Um, and so they will still have reported the dream, even if it wasn't during REM sleep. Um, additionally, they may have reported fantasies that happened when they were quite drowsy, um, where the brain activity is similar to that whilst in sleep. So these are extraneous variables that we just cannot control for, which could have impacted the experiment. Another criticism is that we cannot generalise the findings. There were only 12 participants, most of which were female, so we cannot generalise the findings beyond these individuals. The final criticism is that there is a lack of construct validity. So the dreams and fantasies, they were rated and reduced to numbers. So we highly oversimplified the idea of dreaming into a number score. Some psychologists think that qualitative analysis might be better for this kind of thing. So that's your other 
at core study um, and theory of dreaming. The final thing we're going to look at is was applications of this uh, content, particularly looking at insomnia treating or treatments. So the first treatment um, from this is looking at sleep hygiene. So sleep hygiene is taking what we know um, and applying it into insomnia. So we looked at the cause of insomnia being kind of consuming caffeine, alcohol, or large meals before bed. So the idea there is don't do that. And also to look at the physical environment of where you are sleeping. So you want to have a dark room, it has to be quiet and of a mild temperature, and this should hopefully promote sleep. The other application is looking at relaxation techniques. So the three that you need to know are clearing the mind, deep breathing, and then relieving tension in your body. And there are YouTube videos as to um, how to do this that you can look up uh, on YouTube. Uh, and the reason why we do these relaxation techniques is they rebalance the nervous system. So during times of stress, or sorry, all the time you've got two branches of your nervous system. You've got the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. Now, during times of stress, the sympathetic nervous system responds and is highly active, but it is the parasympathetic nervous system that allows it, you kind of to calm down and allows to kind of promote sleep and relaxation. So re doing these uh, relaxation techniques allows the parasympathetic nervous system to balance out the stress and anxiety, which of course your sympathetic nervous system to become heightened and hopefully to promote sleep. So that there is an overview of sleep and dreaming.